Okay, today we're going to be doing the femur bone. So one of the long bones of the lower limb and uh, it is considered to be the strongest and longest long bone. And what you see in front of you is the right femur bone. Now, the first thing we're going to do is to learn how to identify it, then determine the side orientation, then we'll look at the parts individually. Now, if you see this femur bone, the other long bones that you did before were the humerus. And uh, in comparison to the humerus, you may have noticed that uh, if you were to look at the proximal part of this bone, you'll be able to see that like the humerus, it does have a rounded head. But notice how the neck is more elongated. Aside from that, there are other different features which differentiate it from the humerus. And even down below, in the distal end, you can appreciate the two condyles and they're quite a different shape from the humerus. Side determination. The, to determine the side of the femur, you just have to follow three rules. Rule number one is the proximal end will always have this rounded head on top. The bottom will always be the opposite, opposite to the rounded head. Number two, the head should face medially, right here. If you were to take <coughs> the, uh, this side as the midline, the head would be facing towards the medially. Let me basically also expose the help bone as well and you will appreciate it more better right over here this is your right hip bone so obviously this right here where the pubic symphysis is, is the midline so the head of the femur should be facing medially and notice how this same head is articulating with the hip bone the hip bone you should have done previously it's nicely fitting in into the acetabulum this is a ball and socket joint right here anyway Last rule is, if you were to look on the posterior aspect, right over here, there are certain structures here that you will appreciate. One you can see right over here is the thing which I'll explain later, the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter, two bony elevations right over here. These must be more facing posteriorly along with the intertrochanteric crest. I'll get to these points later. Although the greater trochanter is visible from the front as well, and even the lesser one, they're more located towards the posterior side. And if you were to go downwards, you will see this linear aspera on the back side. Furthering down, here you'll finally have the popliteal fossa. The popliteal fossa is not located anteriorly. <clears throat> we have the patellar area here, the patellar fossa. But on the back side, you have this popliteal fossa. Applying these three rules, you can then we can then determine which side the femur is. Head on top, facing medially, Popliteal fossa on the back. This is the right femur. Now let's go to the individual parts. Overall, this entire femur has a head, a neck, the shaft, and the condyles below. We're going to start at the top. Let's look at the head portion right over here. I'm going to hide the hip bone. Now, as you can plainly see right over here, the head, if you were to look medially, Right at the apex of this head, you see this depression, pit-like depression. This is your fovea, right over here. This is the fovea, and uh, what we have here actually is the ligament of the head of the femur. In adults, uh, this ligament attaches to this head and into the acetabulum of the hip bone. In the fetal life, and in the infants, basically, you have an artery which is passing through here, which supplies the, <clears throat> the head of the femur. This artery still exists in the adult life as well, but uh, it narrows down considerably compared to the fetal life. So, depending upon certain pathological conditions, the blood supply in this artery can be compromised and then it can cause ischemic necrosis of the head. One patient I encountered personally was a patient of thalassemia, that uh, boy was suffering from 
necrosis of the head of the femur due to the obstruction of the artery right over here. <clears throat> anyway, back to where we were. Let's see how I can undo this. Clear all. Here we go. Now, if you were to look over here, here you can appreciate the neck. Now, the thing is, the neck is trapezoidal in shape. The narrow part is attached to the head, while the broad part is attached to the shaft. Another thing to mention is that this neck, along with the shaft, is making a certain angle. This angle right over here, let's see how we get this thing to work. All right. Now, this is your, known as your angle of inclination. Normally, in adults, the average, it's roughly about 126 degrees. In uh, children, it's much higher, 130 or above. And as you grow older, it becomes more uh, acute, 120, can even be lower actually. But normally, you, it's around average 126. This angle of inclination, the purpose of this angle of inclination is basically that it allows uh, the whole femur to be perpendicular to this hip bone. If there were no angle of inclination, this whole femur would be, you know, directly parallel with the hip bone. But this angle of inclination allows it to be perpendicular and this in turn makes it much easier to walk. The articulation with the femur and the hip bone, it's facilitated by this angle. So this angle, uh, it's not the only angle which is present within the femur. If you look at, look at the top side, to adjust this like so, right over here, I guess. There we go. And uh, wrong one. Now, I'm drawing a line transversely from the head and neck. And this center right here is the long axis. You Here you have the long axis and the transverse axis. In truth, actually, um, here we go. I'm going to draw this like so. The dotted line. I'll try rotating it. It's a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> Start all over again, actually. Excuse me. Well, the point I was trying to make was actually is that if you were to draw a line transversely from the head to the shaft so it's not straight actually it's oblique if this is the transverse line passing straight from the head to the shaft this is how actually the uh, the angle is with from the head to the shaft the transverse uh, line and here's a long axis right over here basically and this ang uh, angle is usually around 12 degrees this uh, oblique line right over here along with the angle of inclination these two things are facilitating the all types of movements at this joint flexion extension and uh, it just facilitates the movement makes it easier to walk but keep bear in mind because of these angles a lot of the weight is transmitted at the level of the neck although obviously the entire body weight has to transmit through the head and neck and to the shaft but because of this angle, a considerable load is placed on the neck right over here. And in older individuals and individuals with pathological conditions like uh, osteo <clears throat> osteoporosis, any sort of uh, increased burden above the threshold can actually damage this area. Bear in mind, females, their angulation is naturally more than males. Moving on, let me hide the hip bone again. Now. Right over here, you can appreciate a bony elevation known as the greater trochanter. This right over here is the greater trochanter. And over here, you have the lesser trochanter. But to draw a covering on both of them, here you have the lesser trochanter, and this is the greater trochanter. But here's the thing. The line joining these two is known as the intertrochanteric line and this line actually goes further to the back side let's look at the back for a minute 
You can appreciate the lesser anterior trochanter are also pretty visible in the back. So that line, as it was coming back, it forms a spiral line right so over here. This intertrochanter line comes on the back, forms a spiral line. There's also a small perpendicular line passing over here known as the pectineal line from the lesser trochanter. And over here, you can find, you can see the rest of the greater trochanter. Now, in the front, as I told you, there was an intertrochanteric line. But on the back side, the line being formed over here, this is known as the intertrochanteric crest. And although not very visible on this 3D model, but an elevation on this intertrochanteric crest is known as a quadrate tubercle. Uh, let's see if we can uh, find that over here, although I can't really appreciate it right here. There's an elevation on this intricate track known as quadrate tubercle. I believe in the books it's also referred to as the Kalar. Anyway, if you were to look on the inside immediately, you can appreciate this trochanteric fossa over here. Certain muscles are inserted into this area, right over here. The uh, trochanters themselves, they have attachment of certain muscles, but this fossa also provides space for other muscles as well. A lot of the abductors are attached over here. We'll do a little overview of the muscles after this. Moving on, if you see down below, this, these two lines over here, these two lines are known as your medial and lateral lips of the linea aspera. This right here is your linea aspera and here the medial and lateral lip. The medial lip as is continuous with the spiral line, but the lateral lip goes up and over here, well, actually it's more down below that, yeah, I'll put over here. Here you have the gluteal tuberosity, again not prominent on this 3D model. Here you have insertion of the gluteus maximus. Now, if you go down further along the shaft, I, don't, I believe I've covered the most majority of the head and neck portion. Not much else to see there. Now let's go down. Again you can see the linea aspera on the shaft. Here you can appreciate a nice nutrient foramen. I believe that's what they were trying to show here. although. The hole is not that deep. It could actually, it's this one. Yes, I've, here's the nutrient foramen, 3D way. Anyway, going further down, notice how this same linea aspera divides into two lines. These are your medial and lateral supracondylar lines. And these themselves, they're going to meet the condyles, medial and lateral condyles. Now, the condyles themselves, the inferior part of the femur articulates with the tibia. Let's show, uh, make the tibia visible. Let's see over here. Here we go. Notice how we can appreciate the condyles of the femur articulating with the condyles of the tibia. You have menisci over here, which well, I'm, chalo, I'll make those visible as well. Menisci. Hmm. Here we go. Much better. So these fibrocartilaginous connective tissue are cushioning the condyles from the tibia. Anyway, having that said, the condyles in between the two of them, here you have your, right over here, this is your popliteal fossa area because it's the region of the uh, popliteal fossa. A lot of the structures you see behind your knee passing through this area right over here. And uh, over here you can appreciate the condyles themselves have supracondylar parts as well. This over here is a supracondylar, a lateral supracondyle so, and the medial supracondyle. The thing I want to show is at this region right over here, this is an elevation known as the adductor tubercle for the insertion of the adductor magnus. It's only found on the medial supracondyle. Finally, here you have the patellar area, the patellar fossa, because you'll have the patellar bone visible here. And let's draw that as well. Patella. There we go. There. I'm going to appreciate how this patella is right over overlying this patellar area. And with that, we have covered every part of this bone, of the femur bone. 
and uh, I'm just gonna make everything else invisible again just for the sake of just isolating the femur here we go with that said those are the major parts of the femur and uh, one last thing to note um, it's not a minor point but it's an important point nonetheless if you see over here near the neck you must keep in mind okay this intertrochanteric line right over here this allows attachment of the fibrous part of the capsule as well as a ligament known as the iliofemoral ligament aside from that over here medially the, these lines which I'm drawing over here these show the attachment of your synovial membrane of the capsule here it's reflecting, here it's attached while this thing I showed previously this was basically attachment of the iliofemoral ligament and the fibrous capsule just a small point I wanted to mention we'll be moving on to the overview of the muscles I won't do the muscles in detail uh, that'll be done in the next lecture by a different facilitator we'll be just looking at superficially how the muscles are overlying this femur bone and then finally we'll touch upon the clinicals as well